welcome to the show that focuses on Mother Africa. It's always a pleasure to have you with us. This week on the show, we host Ambassador Masharia Kamau, based at the United Nations in New York. He spearheaded the development of SDGs and shares his thoughts on Africa leadership and development. We get your views on the issues. And as always, we have Africa's top 10. You're watching the Africa Leadership Dialogues. I'm Julie Gishu. Welcome to another episode of Africa Leadership Dialogues. And this week, we host Ambassador Masharia Kamau. Let's take a look at his profile. Masharia Kamau is Kenya's ambassador and permanent representative to the United Nations. He is a development and humanitarian expert and a social and environmental advocate. He also serves as the special envoy of the Secretary General of the United Nations on El Nino and Climate. He is also the chair of the UN Peacebuilding Commission. Ambassador Kamau was instrumental in developing the Sustainable Development Goals and UN's 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development as co-chair and co-facilitator of the respective intergovernmental negotiations. Kamau was international consultant to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the United Nations AIDS. He is the recipient of the Elizabeth Howe Award Gold Medal for Environmental Diplomacy in 2014 and was awarded the Moran of the Burning Spear by the Government of Kenya in 2012. During his tenure in New York at the UN, Kamau also sat as president of the UNICEF board, president of convention of state parties of people living with disabilities, and president of the United Nations Forest Forum, among other responsibilities. He had previously worked for 25 years with UNICEF and UNDP on multiple assignments around the globe. Ambassador, it's such a pleasure to host you on the Africa Leadership Dialogues. Now, you've been in the development space, in the diplomatic space for many years. Um, just looking at Africa today, I want to get a sense of where you think the continent is in terms of development. What are our greatest challenges? What are our greatest opportunities? Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me on your program. Um, and just to get straight to the point, uh, you know, I, I'm one of those people who believes that um, uh, Africa is at a very important point uh, in its development uh, progression. And Africa is really no different uh, than many other con continents uh, on, in the world, in spite of what people might want to say. Mm -hmm. And um, there's always a time of transition um, there are times of inflection when political processes, economic processes, social processes come together and things begin to happen. There are times when things go forward uh, and then sometimes there are times when things unfortunately pull back. Mm -hmm. The key to all of this is usually uh, the kind of leadership that you have in a country, uh, the kind of friends and relationships that your country has with other countries, mm -hmm. friendships, if you will, uh, that your country has with other countries, particularly its neighbors. Um, and when a country or a continent like ours has gone through the experience that it went through in the 20th century, where most of it was spent in a colonial experience, right. and then the latter part in a neo-colonial experience, where you are trying to unwind the problems and the difficulties that were created by colonialism. And the systems and the processes. And the that, systems and right. the processes, the undereducated, no educated people, bad governments, bad leaders. You had to work your way out of this, uh, and you need to work your way out mm -hmm. of this. And we're right now at the point where at 50, which is really where most African countries are, 50, 60 years old, mm -hmm. you really get this new crop of leaders who are born of an independent state, who are believing in themselves, who are well educated, mm -hmm. who see a different vision for the continent, who've already seen what has happened in the past and want something different for their future. Mm -hmm. And so you will find, and if you look across the continent, that there are a number of countries right now that are beginning to outperform in very special ways because of their leadership 
because they've been through these difficulties and because they now have enough of a crop of leaders, uh, of uh, entrepreneurs, of social actors, to begin to transform the nations and to make them move forward. So we are in a very special space is what I'm saying. Uh, and it'll take us about maybe another five, 10 years to truly maximize uh, the opportunity that this space provides. But we are, we are, we are getting there. I'll come back to challenges in a moment, but I want to tap into to the environment that we're in and the fact that for many, many years, many African countries didn't quite have a seat at the global table. You know, and, and um, fighting for that space, fighting for relevance, trying to create an African agenda or national agendas for foreign policy. Um, you have led the world in, in really putting together the SDGs. In so many ways, you've been at the forefront of development globally within the UN system. And I think you're perfectly placed to speak to whether or not African leaders are starting to build enough confidence to take a seat at the table and to ensure that the interests of their African constituents are represented as they sit at that table. Is it happening at oh, all? Oh, absolutely. And it's always happened. Oh, really? Absolutely. Let, let us understand each other. Yes. The reason why Africa got its independence a short 50 years ago mm -hmm. was precisely because African leaders engaged the international community, okay. engaged, engaged the colonial leaders, and broke them down and finally created the opportunities for independence. This did not happen willy-nilly. Right. It happened because there were political leaders with vision, with determination. But we are, we are looking at a different challenge right now and I think this is what you're pointing at, at the challenge of development, the challenge of accelerated development that is able to keep up with the challenges of society and the challenges of the economy. Mm -hmm. This crop of leaders who are now coming into their own are indeed truly engaging the international community. You know, you've seen the president of Kenya at the G7, mm -hmm. at the Belt and Road uh, Conference in China, at the UN, manifesting himself in a way in which you can only be proud of if you're a Kenyan. Right. And it is because the moment has arrived in history where we need that kind of leadership to put us in those positions where we are able to engage with the other leaders of the world in a way in which we can become truly drivers mm -hmm. of our own political, economic, and social process. Right. And I might add that if we play our cards right, we can even become drivers of a global agenda, as we indeed did with the SDGs and the 2030 Agenda for Development. You know, that's transformational. It and, is. and for many of us who grew up in an Africa where, let's be honest, in many ways, we were taught to self-loathe. Mm -hmm. We were taught mm -hmm. there was hopelessness on this continent of ours. We yeah. were taught we can't achieve certain things. So to hear you say that we could start to push the global agenda, let alone the African agenda, is totally reframing the way we think. I want to focus for a moment on looking at the transition between that push for independence, mm -hmm. um, self-determination, the vision for Africa and somehow there seemed to be a disconnect somewhere in the middle and now we're at a place where you're saying we're getting it together again in terms of leadership what did we get wrong do you think in the in between and what mistakes do we need to avoid moving forward I don't know that we got things wrong per se okay. although of course there were terrible leadership issues okay. it, it was that we didn't have the institutions to allow us to organize ourselves in ways in which we, we could become powerful and meaningful in the world. Mm -hmm. Right now, we saw the transition from the OAU to the AU. A lot of people are very cynical and dismissive of the AU. I am a great admirer of that institution because of what it's trying to do under very difficult circumstances, using and working with countries that are themselves challenged. It's like having a membership that is made up of poor people. It's not going to do exceptional things. And it might aspire to, but it might be limited by its resources. Mm -hmm. But despite all of that, we now have Vision 2063, which is an amazing vision that is looking to, to help African countries come together, organize together to transform their continent. With a common agenda. With a common agenda. Because it's only a common agenda 
It's only working together, as I said a little earlier, with your neighbors mm -hmm. that's going to allow us to get where we want to get to faster and fastest. Right. And in my opinion, we have to appreciate that it needed to take time. We needed to go through the transition of building our human capital, of putting together our private sector, mm -hmm. of putting together our institutions, of putting together credible in constitutions that allowed ownership, okay, and allowed the passion of the people to manifest itself in society. Mm -hmm. We had to get there. Stay with the Africa Leadership Dialogues. Um, I want to come to the development agenda now. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you, before I ever met you, I heard of you. And I heard of you internationally. People said there is this Kenyan who has been at the forefront of creating the SDGs. Now, I want you to speak to those who are not very familiar with what these SDGs are. What impact could they have on our lives? Why were these development goals set up? And what could they mean for Africa, for Kenya, for Rwanda, for Nigeria, mm -hmm. for South Africa? What could they mean? The SDGs are nothing but our, everybody's aspiration mm -hmm. for a better world, a sustainable world. We're going to develop. Every country is going to develop. The question is, are you going to develop well or are you going to develop badly? If you develop badly, you end up in a dirty city in, with bad infrastructure, with chaotic uh, traffic, with criminality, with terrorism. There are many ways to develop. It's still a development. Mm -hmm. After all, even our country has developed over the last 50 years. Could it have done better? For sure. So the question is, what kind of development do we want? We want sustainable development. One in which we are able to protect our environment. One in which we are able to protect our rivers. One in which we are able to protect our seas and oceans. One in which we are able to protect our food sources. Why? Because if we don't, we won't make it. And I'm not saying that in a light sense. I'm saying there's a gentleman called uh, Professor Hawkins, who mm. people may have heard of. Yes, Stephen Hawkins. Stephen Hawkins. Mm. He said... Uh, about a couple of weeks ago, that if humanity continues on the same trajectory, ignoring the, imp the imperative of creating a sustainable planet, okay, dealing with issues of climate change, mm -hmm. issues of managing our oceans, which we are killing, mm -hmm. issues of managing our forests, which we are destroying, issues of managing our fisheries in our rivers and our lakes, which we are busy over-consuming, we will not be able to be able to live on this planet a hundred years from now. Does that sound like a long time? A hundred years? It's a very short time if you ask me. Mm. Because that would have meant that if this was happening during my grandparents' time, I would not be alive today because I would not have a planet in which to live. This is a threat to our grandchildren. So your grandchildren yes. are basically being tracked for unsustainability. So the sustainable development goals, and this is why they've caught on mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. This is why America, China, the Scandinavian countries, Germany, it doesn't matter, Latin America, it doesn't matter where you go, mm -hmm. they are talking about them now. Because they've recognized that what we have been trying to get across is actually true. I want to continue in that vein. You know, it's a sobering thought that this is literally about survival, these development goals. And um, on the government on, our, on this planet of ours, the government uh, of Kenya has, um, uh, you know, incorporated the SDGs into the performance targets, um, which, is, which is very powerful. What do you expect to see from other stakeholders? And I must say, as, as our organization, we're working in schools through Great Debaters Contest to educate young Kenyans on the SDGs. So we feel as private sector, there's a role that we're playing. How would you encourage others to be part of this engagement? Well, let's first of all start with young people. Mm -hmm. There is nothing more urgent for young people 
than to have a place to live and for their children to live in. Okay. For them, this is a matter of survival. My generation can probably continue living with plastic and garbage and dirty rivers. And we're going to die off soon you know, anyway. We, we don't have we're that much further to go. Going to. Okay? Yes. But for the next generation and the generation after that, right. this is serious. Okay? So they need to understand that they need to become invested in every government and in every administration that is going to set the stage for their future and recognize that the SDGs and governments that do embrace the SDGs are the ones that have their interest at heart. Mm -hmm. So that's one constituency. Private sector is another. The SDGs and the 2030 Agenda, in particular, has recognized that we are going to need not billions of dollars that, uh, or hundreds of millions of dollars that we used to spend on development, but we're going to need trillions of dollars to get us where we need to get to in a planet that is able to sustain itself through time. And so the question is, how do we unlock trillions? Where do you find these trillions? Yeah. Okay, it's not gonna come from aid. The, the so-called rich countries are, big, are running broke. Mm -hmm. They don't have money to spend on aid anymore. The uh, new emerging economies are busy spending on themselves, although countries like China and India are doing very important things uh, in, in, in helping others, but they have to invest in themselves first. Mm -hmm. We have to get very serious about building the capability to create the kind of wealth that we need in our countries that yeah. would help us invest in things that will ensure we have a sustainable country and a sustainable planet in which to live. Mm -hmm. You can have a city like Nairobi I read in the newspaper the other day, you had a cases of cholera. Right. I mean, cholera <laughs> is one of the most uh, powerful indicators of f a failing health city. Mm. No. City. City, not health system. It's got nothing to do with the health system. Mm -hmm. It's got to do with sanitation. And that is infrastructure. You see? So when we are dealing, when, although the health ministry has to run over there and try and sort out that mess, the cause of that mess is, is the, sanit is is the, the infrastructure. Is the failure of the sanitation and infrastructure pro, uh, capabilities. Right. And this c city is being overrun by people and I'm afraid to say animals since you see them all over the place as well. Mm -hmm. So we have to decide and understand that all these SDGs, from the ones that deal with those basic things to the ones that deal with energy, the way cities are organized and managed mm -hmm. to our earth, basically our, our, our forests, to our oceans, as I said a little earlier, right through to issues that deal with peace and security and the rule of law, right. okay? Right through to the issues that deal with social cohesion and inclusion, because you can't have a sustainable uh, country or a sustainable community when people hate each other, when people are going at each other because of their race, ethnicity, gender, or whatever. Mm -hmm. These are all things that we have to deal with. And the Sustainable Development Goals and the 2030 Agenda shows the pathway to help countries, communities, and continents, and the whole world pathway to get where we need to get to in a healthy fashion. You know, you, you've just touched on institution building and the, right. the importance of the rule of law and the impos importance of peace. And, you know, uh, several African countries very soon heading into elections. Rwanda is just around the corner. Kenya is coming up straight after that. Um, what are your thoughts on where we are right now in terms of the democratic processes in some of our African states? And what are your hopes as, as, as we face these elections? Well, isn't it exciting that we have democracies that are thriving on our continent. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's, I think Kenya is an exemplar in many ways. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had elections uh, every five years since independence, some good, some not so good. Mm -hmm. um, but we've kept at it. Uh, it's a testament to uh, the determination of Kenyans to remain committed to the democratic path, even with all its difficulties, right. all right? 
Winston Churchill said, you know, democracy is a terrible system, bar it's any the best other. We have. It's the best we have. Bar <laughs> any other, you know. <laughs> so it's for, us, it's for us to recognize this, yeah. embrace it, uh, fix it, uh, localize it, nationalize it, mm -hmm. do, what lo you know, do whatever we have to do to indigenize it in our, in our, in our, in our country. Mm -hmm. But recognize that it comes with risks, and we have to manage those risks. And we must not be careless about those risks, mm -hmm. because those risks could very easily upend democracy. And by the way, it's happened in many countries in the world, in Europe and in other places, in Latin America and Asia, where you've had great democratic progress, and then a sudden reversal. Under the Trump presidency, there's lots of talk about where we expect America to go. You're based in New York. Do you have, very quickly, just some thoughts on, on where America is today and what it means uh, in terms of leadership? I think America is exactly where it needs to be today. Okay. Um, it, it is, it is, it is the, the atypical uh, democratic experience in the sense that it continually reinvents itself. Um, and a lot of people have been slightly taken aback uh, by the Trump presidency. Mm -hmm. But I think we need to recognize that he came out of a political process that Americans have accepted. We already have come to the end of the interview. I am going to welcome you back. When you are next in Nairobi, we hope to host you with a group of Kenyans and, and primarily young people Absolutely. to have a discussion. But for now, I would ask you to please look into the camera and just deliver a message to Africa. You know, uh, in many ways, we've spoken about the work that you do. And you say, you know, I do not do it for me. In many ways, I do it for the legacy it gives to Kenya, the legacy for Africa and, and the responsibility that I have is important for that legacy. Um, what what would you teach or what would you share with the Africans watching this show? Well, what I would say is that uh, the future of the continent is amazingly bright and it, it, it attracts us. It, it only seeks for us to believe in ourselves as Africans and to believe in the potential of our continent. That's all. And if we do that, we will amaze ourselves and amaze, amaze everyone else in the incredible future that awaits us. Do you believe? All you need to do is just sit down for a moment, think about Africa, and believe in the potential. And then you'll find your position in actualizing that. Thank you so much. What a pleasure and an honor to have you on the You're show. You're welcome. You're very Thank welcome. You. Stay with the Africa Leadership Dialogues. What a fascinating discussion. I feel like we've just tapped into the whole issue of development and Africa alongside leadership. So much more we can discuss with the ambassador and we hope to invite you for a public session with him in the future. Right now though, let's go to your views on the issues. This week we asked you, what role do youths play in achievement of sustainable development goals? Michael Okumu says, Bolstered by broader connectivity and access to social media, youth have the power to act and mobilize others. Hence, youth activism is on the rise. Hi, I'm Abigail Kadu from Masano University, watching ALD. And our youths best understand the problems they face and can offer new ideas and alternative solutions. To join our conversation, go to our G Plus page, Africa Leadership Dialogues. On Facebook, Africa Leadership Dialogues. On Twitter, at Africa LD. And on WhatsApp, send your video comments to plus 254-715-816-033. And now, to Africa's Top 10. On Africa's Top 10 this week, we feature the cleanest cities in Africa. Clean cities promote physical and mental health of its citizens. They also attract tourists. These days, cleanliness is a prime matter of concern in many African cities. Starting us off at number 10 is Windhoek. Windhoek is the capital and largest city of the Republic of Namibia. It is a clean city and has adopted innovative ways of utilizing local communities for solid waste collection and removal. Coming in at number 9 is Dar es Salaam. Dar es Salaam is the largest and richest city of Tanzania. 
Despite its national significance, the city was known to be one of the most trash-riddled cities in Africa. Things are changing for the better. Positioned at number 8 is Libreville. Libreville is the capital and largest city of Gabon. It is home to almost half of the population of Gabon. It is a clean city with good paved roads. Libreville looks like a European city. Taking the number 7 spot is Accra. Accra is the capital and largest city of Ghana. It is centered on British, Danish and Dutch forts and the surrounding communities. Accra is relatively clean but the city tends to accumulate filth. Slotted in at number 6 is Tunis. Tunis is the capital and largest city of Tunisia. It is a fairly clean city relative to other cities in North Africa. The city council is responsible for keeping the city clean. Habarone takes the number 5 spot. As the capital city of Botswana, Habarone is one of the fastest growing cities in the world. Habarone is managed by the Habarone City Council, which has taken many steps to keep the city clean. The pace of growth of the city has posed many challenges to the authorities. At number 4 is Nairobi. Nairobi is the capital and largest city in Kenya. Popularly known as the Green City of the Sun, the city is governed by the county government of Nairobi. In July 2014, Nairobi's governor unveiled 14 new garbage collection trucks and one wheel loader to boost the city's capacity to handle solid waste. Anchored in at number 3 is Johannesburg. Johannesburg is the largest city in South Africa and one of the 50 largest urban agglomerations in the world. The authorities in this modern and prosperous African city encourage residents of Johannesburg to volunteer their time to help clean up public places. Coming in at number 2 is Port Louis. Port Louis is the capital and most populous city of Mauritius. The city is Mauritius economic, cultural and political center. Port Louis is administered by the Municipal City Council of Port Louis. At number 1 this week is Cape Town. Located in South Africa, Cape Town has won many prestigious international travel awards. Nestled between the ocean and the mountains, the city has all the amenities and sophistication of an urban area. Together with all Cape Town residents and visitors, the city's solid waste management department is responsible for ensuring general cleanliness in the streets and in public spaces. And that's Africa's Top 10 this week. As always, we end with words of African wisdom. Our African proverb this week goes, You don't ask for palm oil with a gourd that has no opening. As Africa, we must position ourselves strategically for development, for growth, for progress, and for equity. There's lots of work to be done. We need to lay the foundations, and each of us, at leadership level, or citizenry level, you need to stand up and be counted. Blessings to you and blessings to Africa.